Good morning, everyone. We'll be starting shortly. Good morning, Ms. Griffin. Morning. How are you this morning? I am good. I'm coming to you guys live from a living room. So I'm hoping I'm not interrupted by small children or dogs. <laughs> that is quite okay. I'm going to be your facilitator this morning. Do you want me to monitor the chat for you? That would be great. Yeah, since I can't see it. Okay. And do you want me to wait? Will you come to a, a pause to take questions or are you okay with me interrupting? Um, um, yeah, I have time built in at the end for questions. That's, that'll work. Okay. Okay, we'll get started shortly. Okay, if you're ready, we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the STAR redesign session. We're excited to have with us this morning, Rachel Griffin. Um, she is a program manager of student assessment at TEA, TEA excuse me. Um, and without further ado, I'll pass it over to you, Ms. Griffin. Thank you. Hi, thank you guys so much for being here. I thought nine o'clock on a Saturday, I'm going to be talking about three people. So this is really impressive. Way to go, guys. Um, I am Rachel Griffin, and I am the STAR Program Manager at TEA. I've been there about 10 years. Prior to that, I had uh, seven years in a high school English class. So this is something near and dear to my heart. Um, we are going to be talking today about the STAR redesign that is going to be rolling out this spring um, and kind of what we're doing to hopefully support um, the ideas of, of good literacy, reading comprehension um, that you guys have in the classroom. So give me two seconds. I'm gonna make sure I can share my screen correctly. <clears throat> Okay. All right, can everybody see? Someone give me a thumbs up, great. All right, so like I said, I am Rachel Griffin. I'm the STAR Program Manager, and I'm here to talk to you today about how we are trying to better align the STAR test to the instruction that's happening across the state. Um, we aren't totally ignorant of the fact that, unfortunately, a lot of districts will, at the 
the tail wag the dog as it were and that the star test can sometimes drive a lot of the time that you use in the classroom and we don't want that as much as you don't want that so um, what we're doing hopefully uh, with these changes is kind of making it a situation where you do not have to try to mimic what we're doing we're actually mimicking what you're doing so as long as you keep doing the amazing things you're doing you guys will be great so Let's talk for a second about what STAR is. It is a state summative assessment. And summative assessments can serve a lot of purposes, um, but really what they're there to do is to talk about what the student's breadth of knowledge and skills are, to determine the effectiveness of curriculum instruction programs at a really high level, uh, to help determine which individual students should per perhaps receive those additional holistic supports, and to serve as a bar for rigor and standards alignment in planning. So when we think about that, that means that there's a lot of things that STAR can't do um, and won't tell you at the, at the individual level. Sorry, things popped up here. Um, but we're not here to talk about how STAR can be quote unquote better because it has been proven over and over and over again to be a valid, reliable, aligned test to the TEKS. Um, we know that the passages are at a readability grade level, and we know this because there have been a number of legislatively mandated studies um, that have come out over the years recently, um, making sure that that was the case. And here are some examples of that where we know that, um, for instance, that the test bears a strong association with on-grade on curriculum requirements. Um, those reading passages, again, are largely aligned. And so... We want to make sure that it's very clear to you guys that the goal of these changes to STAR is not about accuracy, but it's about better aligning the test to what's happening in the classroom and hopefully signals to educators um, that we want to align with their effective instruction. All right, so House Bill 3906 is kind of the reason we are here today. Um, it was intended to improve instructional alignment and the question is, can STAR be designed differently in order to more positively influence instructional practices? Um, we wanted to make sure that we could measure whether students have learned a concept well, and we understand that that's not the same thing as teaching it well. So we wanted to explore the possibility of, you know, is it possible for the STAR assessment to be designed so that it better aligns with strong instructional practices while still accurately measuring student mastery? So that's going to look like a couple of things. Um, we talked to a lot of educators about how STAR impacts their instructional planning and classroom practices, and some of them talked about how they look at STAR questions and ask themselves, you know, am I successfully executing my lessons? Are my kids going to be able to answer these questions at the end of the year? And those are great questions, and that is one of the purposes of STAR. It serves as that bar for rigor and for standards alignment because it has gone through so many various checks and balances. But we also heard from educators that they look at STAR and are sometimes tempted to change some of their classroom practices in not so great ways. So the best example is multiple choice. Currently, um, up through this past December, the STAR test is almost completely multiple choice. <clears throat> and while multiple choice is a great way of knowing if a kid is proficient, it's not a great way of getting them to proficiency. If they don't already understand something, multiple choice is not the best way of helping them learn. The redesign of the STAR is focused on how we can design our test in ways that better align with what we see in the classrooms while continuing to do what it's supposed to do, which is measure student mastery. So based on a lot of conversations and feedback from educators, uh, we really focused on four components of STAR redesign that are directly tied to infect effective instruction. And if we think about effective instruction, it involves uh, coherently building background knowledge. It's not reading a bunch of random passages on random topics disconnected to everything else that's going on. Uh, it's a combination of reading and writing, speaking and listening, because they are all interconnected. It's not just having students read without writing or waiting until fourth grade, for instance, to start teaching writing. Um, effective instruction isn't just multiple choice. You can't feed students answers and have them choose between four options. We know that's not what you're doing in the classroom. So we really want to see students engage, inquire, reflect, create um, all of those actions that you're having them do over and over and over again throughout the school year as part of effective instruction. It also means that we want to make sure to provide supports and accommodations <clears throat> that are appropriate to the student and their grade level. 
so that they can access that grade level content uh, in the same ways that you are doing in the classroom. So we're going to talk about what those can look like and what those will look like this spring. Okay, so the last piece there you see is number five. It's not necessarily one of the components, but um, we're also going to touch on the fact that this is a year. It's a big year for STAR. We had a lot of things kind of converge all at once. We had the redesign. We had, you know, a cap on multiple choice, and we had the movement to online all kind of coming together at once. So um, as we planned for this transition year, all of those things were what we kept in mind. And so one of the pieces that we'll talk about at the end is, is moving to those online assessments. How does it help support all of these different pieces? So the first component of the STAR redesign is based on the importance of building students' background knowledge and vocabulary across all subject areas. And the reason why the background knowledge is so important is that it plays a key role in how students learn to read. There was a study in 1988, two researchers in Wisconsin convened a group of students with very different reading abilities, and some were strong readers and some not so strong, and they asked them to read a story about baseball. Then to check their comprehension, the researchers asked the students to reenact what they read using a model of a baseball field, uh, complete with little player figurines and everything. So here's the passage that they read. I'm gonna give you guys a second to read it yourselves. Okay, so before I show you the results of how the students of the different reading abilities were able to comprehend that passage, um, let me pose this question to you about what the researchers were investigating. Who do you think did the best at reconstructing the story? Was it the students who were strong readers, the students with good knowledge of baseball, or did it make a difference at all? So it turns out there was absolutely a difference. Kids who knew baseball were the best at reenacting the story because of the background knowledge that they brought to the task, um, proving that it was really important uh, as part of the exercise. And while there's a lot of research studies to back this up, we don't really need to understand this through a study. It's pretty obvious, especially when you look at something like this. Take a moment to read this passage. See if you could replicate it. And I can't see you raise your hand, so I'm going to need the facilitator to tell me, but is there anyone who understands what's going on in this passage? Anyone? Unless you're familiar with cricket, it's very unlikely that you were able to follow along. Um, no takers. <laughs> no takers. Uh, I consider myself a very strong reader, but I don't know anything about cricket. So when I read this passage the first time, I was completely lost and that definitely underlines the fact that the background knowledge is so important to the connecting to the text and being able to have it flow, the fluency of it, the ability to um, really discern what's happening. So you can see just how important background knowledge is. And the students that had a high reading level um, and high knowledge of baseball were able to comprehend, yeah. obviously but students with low reading skills and high baseball knowledge performed almost as well. And then there was a large gap between this group of students and the students with low knowledge of baseball and also were weaker readers. Um, again, just underlining that that background knowledge is so key to understanding what it is that you're reading. So in effective classrooms in RLA lessons, let's say they're reading this really exciting story about a sailor that's also a giant. And in science, they're learning about the sun as a source of energy. And in social studies, they're learning about the Alamo. This is great. This is all in the teaks for um, this fourth grade student. Um, they're learning about engaging things with high quality text, but none of these things are necessarily connected. And contrast that with student B, 
and their experience in their RLA class, they're reading, um, writing about the Earth's layers. In science, they're learning about weathering uh, to the surface of the Earth. And in social studies, they're learning about how American Indians adapted to differences on the Earth's surface. We hear from a lot of districts and schools that they're working to expose their students to a very coherent cross-curricular knowledge approach, like student B, so that students are forming those stronger memories, building background knowledge, and ultimately becoming stronger readers. This is an approach that we've seen become far more um, expressed in the last couple of years, and that's why we are trying to pull that in for STAR. So how do we better align our STAR efforts with what the schools are doing to build background knowledge? So what we're going to do is, moving forward, we are prioritizing cross-curricular passages on our RLA tests. We have always tried to make sure that those topics and, and the subject matter, the people that are discussed in those um, passages are obviously on grade level, but we are now going to make a more concerted effort to make sure that we're pulling from um, other places in the TEKS across content, uh, content areas. So one of the most important things I think for people to know, because I did not know this as an educator before I came to TEA, is how rigorous of a process it is to get these passages um, onto an actual test. So there is a group of current Texas educators that comes together, a different group every year representing all the parts of the state, um, different levels of experience and different types of students that they serve. Um, they review all of the passages to make sure that it's quite high quality writing, accurate information. It's not biased towards any particular student group and is as engaging as it can possibly be being on a state test. Um, and that's appropriate for the grade level. And so they really are high quality passages, but up until now, the topics that we've covered, like I said, have been kind of kind of random. So here is an example of how we're adding another requirement to our passages. We're going to be intentionally selecting passages that cover cross-curricular content. So this example of a grade five RLA passage, the Chola Cactus, has direct connections to what the students are learning in third, fourth, and fifth grade science. Students are reading about how this cactus stores water and how other animals depend on the cactus to survive in their environment, which you can connect directly to the science teaks. And although the passage content is connected to the science teaks, this isn't an assessment of science skills. It's still very much an assessment of literacy. Students will continue to be assessed only on RLA teaks, just to be super clear about that. The cross-curricular connection is there to better align our tests with what's happening in the classroom where educators work to ensure that the kids have a background knowledge that they need to become strong readers and set them up for success in the rest of their lives. Um, a personal example, I know when I was in high, uh, taught high school and we read anything um, that was set in a period more than five years ago, or right? any time before those students were born, we always had to do a little mini unit right before. And I usually consulted with our history department, made sure that we were um, all on the same page. But, you know, they needed to learn about what was going on during the time of Great Gatsby for Gatsby to make sense. They needed to know what was going on you know, in these time periods so that they had a better sense of how to interpret and what lens to use when reading that story and what the author could have been uh, bringing to it. So um, it's definitely a real life thing I know happens in the classroom and, and it definitely sets them up for success. So the second component of the STAR redesign is based on that interconnectedness of reading and writing. And we know that writing is important. Uh, in effective classrooms, students are always writing in all grade levels, all subject areas. Um, writing should not start in the fourth grade. In addition, student uh, teachers are supporting students in becoming better readers when they have them write about what they've read. The two are pretty well linked. So let's take a look at two prompts. One is based on personal, whoops, sorry, I've somehow... There we go. Um, so if we look at the two prompts here, one is based on personal knowledge and experience and looks like what we have had in the past for stars. So take a few seconds to read that one. The second one is based on something the students have to read and respond to. And if you ask yourself which of these two prompts is more aligned to the writing that you've been expected to do in your adult life, such as in your job, which of them is really focused on that kind of task? Obviously, the second one. Um, the feedback that we've gotten overwhelmingly from educators is that the second prompt is more instructionally aligned 
Um, and jobs, we're not often asked to write about our experiences at vacations and things like that, but we are asked to research, write a memo, make a recommendation based on the research, um, things of that nature. So taking something that we've read, condensing it or um, filtering it, changing it, presenting it in a different way for another audience um, is a task that students need to know how to do. Research has shown that reading and writing are reciprocal processes. Um, writing about what you read improves your reading comprehension because it requires you to think deeply about what you've read. And additionally, by grounding writing in text, by asking those students to support their ideas with evidence from what they've read, all students will be given an equal opportunity to demonstrate their writing ability. So they're all working with the same source material. There's not an experience that they have to bring um, that they might not have had by the time that they are at that grade level. So this is hopefully uh, also helping to level the playing field a little bit. So previously students were asked to respond to a standalone question on grades four and seven writing tests, as well as English one and two. This is an example from a previous grade four star. And you see there's a tiny bit of reading there in the um, charge. It says Thomas Edison is famous for inventing many things, including the light bulb. But the question itself is not about that, that fact. Students are asked to write about one invention that is important in your life. And while this question is an accurate and valid way of assessing student writing skills, it's not aligned to the interconnected way that teachers are teaching reading and writing in the classroom. So we're going to change that. The Redesign Star will have writing prompts in all grade levels, and students will read a passage and write a response based on what they read. And as a result, the way in which students are reading and writing on Star will hopefully look a lot more like what they're used to doing in their classrooms in successful instruction. So in this um, example here, they're going to read the play, the spelling test, and then the question that they get that they have to write a constructive response to is to explain how a character's behavior changed and how this is developed by the playwright. So they're using that academic language, um, they're having to really dive into the text, then they're having to bring the things that they've learned from class to the test, obviously, but they're not expected to bring anything from their personal experience to it. So again, this is, this is going to help us make sure that these students are really given the opportunity to demonstrate what they know. The third component of the STAR redesign looks at the types of questions that teachers are asking students during highly effective instruction. So in the classroom, we know that students are asked to engage with content in multiple ways lots of different ways so that they can gain and show their understanding. This is an example from a fourth grade math lesson that aligned to the teaks and shows a drawing of a visual model of a fraction decomposition. Questions like this get students to think more deeply than multiple choice questions. And here's an example from a fourth grade RLA uh, class where a student is writing a paragraph about something that they've read and this is actually a great example of those first two components of STAR Redesign. It's cross-curricular topic. It has students writing in response to their reading. In this case, we're combining things from uh, history with the skills that they're learning in their RLA class. And even though multiple choice is a great way to assess student understanding at the end of the year, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's really not a great way for students to learn in classrooms throughout the year. So to better align STAR with the classroom experience, we're adding non-multiple choice questions that are more like the questions that teachers are asking in class. For example, let's take a look at that fourth grade math lesson again. We can create fraction model questions for STAR that look like how students are engaging with fractions in the classroom. And if students are writing open-ended responses in the classroom, we can look at adding more open-ended questions on STAR. So short constructed responses like the one that you see on your screen could be used in science, social studies, and RLA. And so that is the plan. We do not have any of these embedded into any of the math tests um, at this time, um, but you know, using these in both science, social studies, and RLA uh, will give the students the um, that extra connection to what they are already doing in the classroom. So when we develop these questions for STAR, they have to go through um, a pretty rigorous process that a lot of folks aren't aware of, much like the passages that I mentioned earlier. 
Um, a group of Texas educators, again, convene, and they have to get their approval for every single one of the items before it can even move forward to field testing. And field testing is where we can collect the quantitative data to make sure that the item tests, um, test items rather, are what they're supposed to be and that they're not biased toward any student group. And we've really massively expanded our educator outreach to talk about these new question types. And educators felt very strongly that these questions allow students to better demonstrate their knowledge and are more engaging and will even impact their instructional planning. Um, we also engaged over 200 students to give us feedback on these questions. Students participated in think alouds where they um, talked through their approach to the question so that we were able to ensure the question types are intuitive and measuring what they are intended to measure. This is just a, a slide that gives you some of the stats um, where we feel like we are moving in a positive direction. The fourth component of the STAR redesign is about ensuring that all students have the accommodations that they need to access that grade level content. So we know in classrooms, teachers are supporting their kids in a lot of different ways by providing accommodations that students need to access content, such as visual anchors, pre-reading strategies, large print text, just to name a few. And so the redesign really aims, um, as we move into these online assessments, to allow the students to have a more robust suite of accommodations to better support them. There are things that we can offer online that simply aren't available in a paper version of a test. A certain percentage of Texas students have actually been testing online for years because of the accommodations piece and what's available online in the online platform. Um, we're going to watch, and hopefully you guys can hear this. I don't know about the sound. Um, this is a short video that we have. It's available, I think, on YouTube um, and our TEA channel, talking about what's of the accommodations that are um, available online and their benefits. Oh, that's not good. Well, I might have to just narrate some screenshots. I don't know if the facilitator has any, any ideas of what I can do here to show the video. I'm not sure why it's not playing. No, I'm sorry. I sure don't. Okay. All right. Well, did you check your volume by any chance? Yeah, it's just the, the bar actually isn't moving. Oh, the bar is not moving. It's not playing for some reason, which is a problem. Um, okay, so let me see how, how well I can do this. Uh, if we're going to move this forward. So a couple of things that they can do, as you can see, this is um, a screenshot, not a, not a movable visual, unfortunately. Um, so we have created a couple of things just layout wise on the uh, online tests that students don't necessarily have in the paper version, where they can actually, I mean, it's not going to let me do anything, um, where they can expand and decrease, change the size, they can move the, the visual layout of the actual test itself. Um, we have embedded content and language supports, as you can see in this uh, example, if you look over at the item where it has um, paragraph two in a box or the word adapted or technique. Um, these are opportunities for students who qualify for content and language supports to actually be able to click on those words, phrases, um, content, language, whatever it is, and actually get uh, a simplified version or definition of what it is that they're looking at. Um, for that student where he clicks paragraph two, it's actually going to pop up paragraph two and, and potentially read it to them if they also get um, uh, oral administration. So there's a lot of things that we were able to embed into this test. Uh, there's a whole host of things. I really wish this video would work. And if I can, maybe I can grab the, I can't do anything. That's what I can't do. Um, I'll make sure to share the link with you guys. I apologize for that. I didn't realize it was going to block me. 
Um, but we have, like I said, embedded, we have speech to text for the students who need um, who need that support because of maybe a physical disability, the inability to actually capture their thoughts. We want them to be able to show what they know. We have text to speech for the students who um, need the pieces of the text that can be read to them read aloud. Uh, we have all kinds of calculators that we've put in here. We've adapted just recently a new um, graph draw tool so that students have the ability to do what a lot of teachers were already doing on the online test, which is taking essentially a transparency and putting there, allowing them to really play around with it. Um, we've created an online version of that essentially. So um, we're really trying in all of these ways with the accommodations, it's really, it's one of my biggest priorities as the STAR program manager um, is to make sure that we are embedding as many accommodations as this platform will support. Um, and I'm gonna take a just quick minute to let you guys know that we really do uh, listen when you reach out to us about things that you would like to see in the platform. Um, we do not know what you need unless you come to us and tell us, and we are very open to having conversations. Um, we love partnering with districts, with teachers who are maybe leading certain initiatives, um, or especially around things like accommodations, because we want to make sure that they're reflective of what's actually happening in the field. We can do what we think makes sense based on what's kind of happening across the country or what's happening in, in research and studies. But unless it works in an actual classroom, um, then it's it's not a benefit. And we want to make sure that we're prioritizing the things that you guys actually need. So please always feel free to reach out to us. It doesn't matter at what level you are in a district. If you are a teacher's aide, you are the superintendent. I do not care. If you think that there is a good idea that would help a student we would love to hear from you. Um, many of these things, like I mentioned, the graph draw tool that came directly from teachers reaching out to us and saying, hey, I really want my kids to be able to draw on those graphs, but I don't wanna have to hand them a transparency because they might hand it to Tommy who does the exact same you know, thing and it's a security issue and blah, blah, blah. So we, we went in and we looked at how we could support them in that. So those are the kinds of things that I'm hoping to hear from you guys as we encounter what this new test looks like and you get an opportunity to see what kinds of things are involved. Oh, now it's gonna play. All right, well, let's listen. Be sure to cover difficult vocabulary and proper nouns so students can hear them ahead of time. High school student Charlotte Brown competed in the Texas State Track and Field Meet in 2013, where she won eighth place in the pole vault by jumping 10 feet six inches high. Passages can be expanded and text enlarged for readers who need oversized text. The line reader tool helps readers keep track of their place within the passage. Pop-ups and rollovers use images, animations, definitions, or simplified language to contextualize ideas. An online dictionary and notepad mirror the accessibility tools a student uses in the classroom. Text-to-speech is also available for questions and answer choices for students who need this accommodation. Use soaring to new heights to answer the following question. Which sentence best expresses the main idea of paragraph two? Option A, Brown adapted her technique as for vision portion. The answer eliminator allows students to cross out answer choices. Reading parts of a passage through text to speech allows isolated or specific information from the passage that is referenced to the question to be read aloud. In 2014, as a junior, Brown found herself in familiar circumstances. She had made Okay, so I'm glad I was able to show you guys what those actually look like. Um, as I said, we've, we've done a lot of study, we put a lot of students in front of it, and we're hoping that these are things that are very intuitive for them to use, but they also are being um, mirrored in the classroom instruction that students are actually engaging with these, not just on the day of test when they realize that the tool is there. And the last component of the STAR redesign is also about online testing. And the transition to online assessment not only allows for those accommodations that we just talked about, um, but other benefits as well. 
In addition to the broader access to the accommodations, uh, the benefits of online testing include faster scoring and reporting of test results to families, students, and educators um, so that they have the information to do whatever the best next steps are for the student. It provides uh, simplified testing operations because you no longer have to have teachers interacting with all of these materials, moving them around to different campuses, checking them in, checking them out. Um, it also enables a bunch of other star redesign changes, such as those new question types that are far more dynamic. And I'm going to take just a quick pause to mention uh, as, a, as a side note, because uh, I realized I didn't add it here. Um, we have moved to all online as of this year, um, but we do still have a policy that protects the students who need to take a paper assessment, students who perhaps have a vision issue, who are um, taking a braille version of the test, students who, for whatever reason, have an accommodation that cannot be provided through all the ones that we've embedded in the test. Um, we know that there are students who are still going to need to take paper, and even they are going to be interacting with these new item types. They won't be obviously as dynamic. They're not going to be able to drag and drop something on paper, but they are other item types beyond simply multiple choice. So we have um, samplers of what those look like. And I have been really ringing the bell the last few weeks because I realized not a lot of people know that we have them available um, on our website for you to show kids who are going to be taking that paper version of the assessment uh, so that they can learn what the responses look like, so that they understand I'm supposed to circle this, I'm supposed to draw a line, I get to pick three and not just one, um, and all of that good stuff, so that they are familiar with it the day of testing, because there's not going to be a test administrator who can explain those pieces to them, they're going to have to know how to respond. And then, of course, that test is going to then have to be uploaded into an online system. Um, all tests now are, are scored online. So if that student didn't know how to respond um, and maybe marked four instead of three, then that answer can't be um, recorded. So that's just a little side note. I know it's not necessarily what we're talking about here, but it is something that is kind of front of mind for me because I've talked about it all week. Um, so another thing that I just want to underline is that like all of the components of the star redesign are based on improving alignment of star to what you guys are already doing in the classroom. And when we talk to stakeholders about these changes, um, they're really excited for star to be more aligned. But the common concern that they do have is, does this mean that the star test is going to be harder for students? And the short answer is no. And the next couple of slides explain how we know that. So how do we know that the redesigned star test won't be harder? So on each star test, a small number of questions do not count towards the student scores, and these questions are called field test questions. They're embedded in live tests often so that we get that motivated data. Um, a lot of times if we do a standalone field test and kids know that it doesn't mean anything for them, it's not a grade, um, we don't necessarily get as clean of data as we need, but oftentimes we're able to embed a few questions in each test and since the kids don't know which one counts, they try. And so we get a really good idea of ability um, on those field test questions. And the questions that are field tested are there so we can confirm that they are measuring what they're supposed to and that they're unbiased. In addition to field testing, it gives us a really good idea of how hard each question is based on how many students answered it correctly. And we can look at previous results. We know which students have been successful before and in certain reporting categories. And now they're, you know, maybe they're completely off. And we can look at, is that a question issue? Is that a student issue? Um, and we go through a whole process of data review after those field test questions have been uh, delivered. <clears throat> So after field test question, uh, question testing, we have questions that represent varying difficulty levels and different student expectations. And these questions can then be used to build the star test. And because we know the individual difficulty level of each of these questions, we also know the difficulty level of the entire test. And when we're building the star test year after year, we can make sure that the difficulty level of the test remains the same. If you think about different questions being different weights based on how difficult they are, each question may be slightly different weights year to year, but we can make sure that the overall test weighs the same. So with the star redesign, if a new non-multiple choice question is harder, we'll find that out during field testing, and that'll be taken into account when the test is being built, uh, the operational test. If one question is heavier than the others, it will need to be balanced with lighter or easier questions so that it comes out to the same weight. 
This is where you can see uh, if you review things like skill scores, uh, if you look at where those cutoffs are for the raw score conversion tables and things like that, they usually don't change. There may be one or two by year. And again, that's just because we're trying to hit the exact same target uh, level of difficulty mathematically. Um, but we also um, are making sure that it's just balanced overall. So you're not going to see too much of a difference from year to year, if at all. We've been working really closely with educators to implement the STAR redesign, and one of the things that we hear a lot is the need for resources and supports to make sure that educators are understanding the changes that are coming and how they can best explain those to their stakeholders. So many of the resources that we put together in response to that feedback can be found on our STAR redesign page, which is on the TEA website. It has been linked here. But other resources include um, the full-length practice tests that resemble the redesign star, the new question type samplers by content area and grade level, the overview of new question types by content area and grade level, the scoring and reporting guides by content area for new question types, including constructed response scoring guides. So this is where you're going to find the rubrics for those open-ended questions for all the content areas where they might appear. Um, how does the student answer it to score um, here, there, or otherwise, uh, and they give you some examples of what that might look like. There are also updated blueprints by content area and grade level. There's also policy on which students qualify for that special paper administration that I talked about. And just to give you guys an idea, and I give such a big kudos to educators that are out there, to campus testing coordinators, to 504 and ARD committee members, uh, for the amazing job that they did in the fall with our students who were taking the EOC assessments in December <clears throat> for those high school students. Um, last December 2021, we had about 66,000 students still testing on paper who hadn't made the transition to online for whatever reason. And this past December, we only had about 800. So that is a significant drop. And it represented only half of less than 1%, I think, of the overall testers. Um, and that is because people really understood the benefit of making sure that the kids knew what they needed to do in that online test and that they were comfortable with it um, and that they really went in and explored all of the things that are available to students and could explain to the committees, to the parents, to the students um, why paper was not going to be something that would be appropriate for them. So we were really able to protect the paper copies for those students who absolutely needed it. And again, just big shout out to everyone across the state who had anything to do with that because it was a resounding success. We're hoping to copy that same kind of thing in spring, but we know we're adding a lot of uh, three through eight kids. So um, we shall see, but hopefully it translates. Um, there's also the updated star redesign FAQs. Love a good FAQ. Let's me know what I didn't even know to think, to ask. Again, as I mentioned earlier, um, we love getting feedback from you guys, questions from you guys. If something's not clear to you, it's probably not clear to other people across the state, and we are always looking for opportunities to improve. Um, so if you ever have something you want to share with us, anything that you feel like um, needs to be discussed, assessed, reevaluated, please make sure that you reach out. Um, there's a couple of ways you can do that through the Student Assessment Help Desk. Hopefully you've used before. Last year we processed over, uh, we have a team of about 25 people. We processed over 10,000 help desk tickets um, in addition to the other work that we do. Um, and it's a really fast way typically to get a response. You can usually get a response within an hour or less um, because it's something that we're constantly monitoring to make sure that we're getting you really up to the date, uh, up to date rather. Uh, information links that you might need and resources that can help. You can also call directly the 512 number and um, depending on what it is you need, you'll be routed to the correct person. Um, if you need to speak with me, you can always just ask for Rachel Griffin. I'm happy to take calls. I take calls all day. That's what I do. Um, or you can also go to our website and scroll around and you might be able to find the answer there. So I try, I think I timed this exactly how I intended believe it or not. Um, I wanted to have enough time at the end that we had time for questions. So I'm going to pop out of this so I can actually see you guys. Your timing was fantastic. Thanks. Any questions? There's nothing in the chat, but if anybody wants to take themselves off of mute. 
and ask a question, you're more than welcome to. I was just so thorough. <laughs> Nobody has any questions. Every, everyone's still working on their coffee, I think. No question. I am um, dropping the link for your attendance in the um, in the chat. So please make sure to click on the link so that you get credit for attending. But if we don't have any questions, I think we're good then. Let's see, hang on, there's one that came through. Our Amplify, our Amplify CKLA unit test available in Ms. Pamita, do you want to take yourself off of mute and ask your question? I can open the chat. Just a second. Um, hold on. Let me see over here. All right. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I have a question. I attended actually the the session uh, when you all offered. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, so maybe like four, uh, three or four weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering, one thing that I understood, I mean, from the presenter was that uh, the F since me Amplify, it's one of the recommended, I mean, uh, TA curriculums, mm -hmm. you know, for this, uh, uh, for school districts, I understood that the, the unit test would be actually available in, in TFAR. And I'm not sure if I misunderstood you know, but uh, and I've been actually trying to to uh, to find it, and, and I couldn't. So that's why I just want to, you know, a clarification. Maybe, as I said, I misunderstood, and uh, you know, oops, there we go. Now I can see myself, and I, I can see now. There we go. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I'm going to be completely honest with you. I I do not have anything to do with TFAR, so I would not be the person to ask that question. I can, however find the answer for you and be happy to communicate it back to you. If you want to send me a direct email with that question, I'm at rachel.griffin at tea.texas.gov. Okay. Um, and I would be happy to track down the answer for you. I, I do get a lot of questions around lots of different kinds of assessments, the, like telepaths and interims and things of that nature. I only do STAR. I do work with the people who do these other ones though, so I can quickly get you an answer. Um, and that's a great question. Okay, thank know. you. I mean, yeah, because I mean, though, after actually I got informed, you know, through the the, the webinar about all the test prep, I mean, the, the uh, test test practice, mm -hmm. you know, and the platform. I mean, I uh, I was able to get into TFAR, and I was like, oh my god, this is so awesome, you know. And yeah. anyway, and there are so many practices in there, so the kids can actually get acquainted with all the tools. Yes. Right. And that's going to be offered and with the platform. But I was also trying to embed this into the curriculum so we don't need to create everything. Sure. You know, and that's uh, pretty much the reason that uh, I was actually looking for this resource. OK. Yeah. Let me look into that for you. I do know that there are some uh, built tests there. I'm just not sure where they're coming from. So I can certainly look into that. Please do email me and I, I promise I will follow up on Monday. Um, if not, I'll bug someone today and, and have that for you <laughs> before the end of the day. Awesome. Believe it or not, I can I can see on my screen there are actually other people other than me working, surprisingly. Um, so yeah, uh, that's a great question. And there's another question I think I can see in the chat. Someone asked about recommended curriculum, or am I aware of uh, anything yes. that goes across the curriculum? Guajardo. So um, again, we're uh, we are very limited in what we can do as far as recommending um, specific curriculum. We can talk about what options are available and out there, but because we are in an independent school district kind of state, those are really going to be things that your school board and your principals, uh, your superintendents are going to have to, to pull in and talk about. What I would recommend, um, because the assessment division doesn't deal so much with the curriculum piece, uh, we are just in the assessing of the curriculum, is that you reach out to that number um, that I put on the previous slide that I can pull up again or put in the chat, um, that you reach out and ask to speak to someone 
in the curriculum division because they actually work with instructional materials and they are going to have a much better grasp of what things are being used across the state and what might work best for your scenario. So depending on what kinds of kids you're teaching and what part of the state you're in, et cetera, they'll probably be able to make a better recommendation than I would off the top of my head. Um, Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm getting a lot of questions about the attendance. The session is not in the drop down. So um, I am going to call tech support and find out what's going on. But in the meantime, we do have one other question. What is, um, hang on, that's a attendance question. Ms. Rehan, I saw you had a question. Yeah, I just wondered about science because I, I, I've heard that I mean, it's been told to us that we will, will they'll have different kinds of questions, but I didn't, my teachers really didn't notice that when we took the interim. So I just kind of wanted clarification. Yeah. So the only item type that isn't represented in the interims, and this is for all content areas, is going to be anything with a constructed response. And that's because that would require more time than we would have in order to get these results back to you. I mean, the whole idea of interims is that you get the results pretty immediately. Um, obviously, if we had to have trained hand scorers go in and, and score every piece of writing for the students, it would be weeks before you got that back. So that's kind of counterintuitive and counterproductive. Um, so yeah, the written response pieces are not and are not planned to be included in the interims, but all of the other item types that could appear on the science test should be in there. And if you're thinking that they're not, or you haven't maybe seen them in, in window one or window two, um, you also have, uh, again, I, hopefully I have a way to share this deck with you guys, um, on the redesign page, we do have a, a number of different charts and graphs that show you by uh, content area and by grade level, the specific item types. So it will tell you like science will have drag and drop, multi-select, inline choice. It actually lists out specifically the types of items that might appear on that assessment. So hopefully that's helpful to you, but uh, really to respond to your question, the, the constructed response pieces aren't going to be something that you see in interims. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um... The uh, link has been updated. So if you will refresh or click on the link again, you should be able to choose a session so that you can get credit for attending. Any other questions before we, for final? No? Thank you so much for sharing with us, Ms. Griffin. We really appreciate your time. Thank you so much to all of you who attended. Um, I agree it is early on a Saturday morning and so you being here just shows your dedication to your students so thank you so much. It's awesome I'm going to shout out you guys to the commissioner next week in a rip around because this is crazy I really thought I was going to be speaking to like three people so I'm just so <laughs> impressed with all the nice dear right now so thank you guys so much. Thank you do you Miss Griffin do you have a Twitter, uh, Twitter handle? I do not. You do not what about your department? um we do not actually TEA mm -hmm. does overall but not my yeah my okay I was just going to tweet you know and make sure yeah, to that's if you had one. I'm on there thank you though. okay awesome thank you so much guys remember the next session starts in exactly 10 minutes at 10 o'clock have a good one